Good morning, everybody. If I could invite you to take your seats and we will begin this session. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, everybody who is here involved in the challenge of disaster risk reduction, we want to uh, wish you a very warm welcome, a good morning, and welcome to this plenary session, Community Resilience, the Foundation of Resilient Nations. This is a session that has been organized by the Community Practitioners Platform for Resilience, CPPR, and the Global Network of Civil Society Organizations for Disaster Reduction, GNDR. And my name is Andrew Bidnell. I've been working with GNDR for the last six years. And my challenge here is to facilitate a conversation being helped by people within our panel who I'll introduce in a second, but also being helped by yourselves, if I could uh, uh, invite you to participate and take part within this session. This is my fourth global platform. You know, and it's, as I look around this room, you know, I'm constantly uh, astounded by the levels of expertise, the different perspectives, the different experience that is within this room, that is on this panel this morning, and also um, the views that we are bringing from our various different constituencies, our various different people that we work with, the various different communities that we are working with, whether that be at a local level, a national level, or an international level. And we have a challenge this morning to try and share some of those views, share some of those perspectives, share some of those opportunities, some of those possibilities as we look forward um, and, and look, at, look at how we as a, as a community here and outside can really increase the impact of all the good work that is being done. So I want to say a big thank you to UNISDR for allowing this session to take place, for pr uh, putting this session right at the heart of this global platform. This is an important session to, for, to hear from a community perspective what is going on at the local level, to hear from government perspectives, local and national government. How, how can we support that community resilience? What's working? What could work better? So thank you very much for making this space available and we look forward to the opportunity this morning. And here at the Global Threat Platform, there are networks of organizations working at the heart of community resilience, ranging from grassroots practitioners, federated self-help groups, members of faith-based communities, and supporting NGOs. And community voices from around the world are seeking the space to tell their stories, share their challenges, share ideas, opportunities, and much work is, take, is taking place both before, during this platform, and after this platform too. So for example, the first two, uh, during the first two days, for the first time ever, a Community Practitioners Academy was held at the start of the global platform, and community practitioners attended and were joined by facilitating NGOs, local government officials, academics, and development professionals. And some of them have joined us on the panel this morning. And a few weeks ago in The Hague, there was a, a, a conference of a global network of civil society organizations exploring the latest themes and findings from Views from the Frontline, um, a program that you, uh, you will no doubt have heard about, which seeks to share local views of progress. So, our collective challenge today is to share some of those perspectives, hear some of those views, and really challenge each other and ourselves as we explore this topic of community resilience and what that means for our discussions on post-2015 developments. So let me just introduce our panel so that we all know who's here, and then we'll be hearing from them in different ways um, over the course of this session. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Godavari Dangi. Godavari at the far end is a, Saki Fed is a farmer, a Saki Federation leader and secretary and a member of Groot's India Network. Godavari, through her work, has inspired over 2,000 grassroots leaders to build resilience in the face of disasters and climate th threats through exchanges and partnerships with government. And we'll be exploring some of those, those themes. Godavari will be speaking in Marathi. So you will need your, uh, um, unless we have, I'm sure we do have some, but m most of us won't speak fluent Marathi, so you will need your uh, um, uh, translation facilities during that particular section. Let me welcome Juta Korovulavula from Fiji. Juta is a regional disaster risk management program officer for the Foundation of the Peoples of the South Pacific International. He's been working at local, national, and international levels, so we look forward to hearing from Juta. 
Heidi Rodriguez is the current president of the board of directors of the Union of Cooperatives Las Bromas, where she has helped 20 cooperatives and a total of 1,200 producers. And Las Bromas is part of the network of women and peace in Central America, the Huayru Commission, Groots International, and the Cafe Conglomerate through the Ministry of the Local Government. Hade has dedicated over the past 25 years of her life to working with women producers. And we look forward to hearing from Hade. Jacqueline Araya Montero is joining us from Costa Rica. Jacqueline is coordinator of the Community Emergency Committee at Puerto Viejo and social promoter for rural, rural water systems. Welcome, Jacqueline. We look forward to, to hearing from you. We have Anna Kwango, who has joined us from Uganda. Anna is Director of Programs for Development Network for Indigenous Voluntary Associations. Welcome to Anne. And sitting next to Anne, I'd like to welcome Minister Alex Birogubo Bakonda from Uganda. Alex is a member of the Ugandan Parliament, representing the Isingiro District. And he also serves as Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of Parliament, Member of the Public Accounts Committee, and Chairman of the Forum on Climate Change for the Parliament of Uganda. So we look forward to hearing from Alex. Also like to welcome Her Excellency the Honorable Nikki Kay, New Zealand Minister of Civil Defense. Welcome. In January 2013, earlier this year, Minister Kay was promoted into the national government's cabinet and given responsibility for the ministerial portfolios of food safety, civil defense, and youth affairs. She's also made associate minister of both immigration and education. And yesterday, Minister Kay was emphasizing, I heard her talking uh, passionately in a session, emphasizing the importance of developing strong partnerships between communities, local government, and national government. And we look forward to exploring some of those themes today. And uh, sitting in the middle from Rio de, de, Rio de Janeiro, welcome to Marcio Moromoto. Marcio is Subsecretary for Civil Defense in the city of Rio de Janeiro. And amongst other work that he's been doing, he's had a particular focus on tackling the land challenge of landslides in Rio de Janeiro. And we look forward to uh, hearing more about the work between communities and local government and how effective that, that's been. And finally, on the, on, the, on the far end, my colleague Violet Chivutse is joining me in helping to uh, facilitate this session and play back some of the themes. So welcome, Violet. Violet is the executive director of Shibui Community, Community Health Workers in Groots, Kenya. She's a founder and leader of the Shibuya Community Health Workers who are now implementing Kenya's national biodiversity policies. And she sits on the UN AIDS Advisory Board and is the regional organizer for the Home-Based Care Alliance, which is a pan-African network of grassroots caregivers, many of which are now linking health and resilience. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our panel. So to help set the context for our conversations, the way we wanted to, to have this session, and, and really, even though we have a big room and we have hundreds of people here, we're very keen to try and make this as, as informal and participatory as we possibly can. So in order to do that, the way we will, we will run this session is we'll hear some from our panelists. Um, some will be speaking, there will be some uh, video shown as well. Um, some will be speaking in different languages, so make sure you have your headphones available if you can. And then we will reflect on some of those themes and open up to have a discussion, a debate uh, within the audience. Um, and I will need your help in that. If you want to make your points, please raise your hands and I will seek to involve you in that conversation. So to help us set the scene, really, for the discussion that we are going to be having, I'm going to ask Anna Quango to uh, join me here and just say a few words to help us set the scene for this discussion. Welcome, Anna. Good morning, Your Excellencies, different dignitaries invited here, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anna Kwango from Uganda, East Africa, and uh, an African for that matter. Uh, this morning, as I stand before this audience, coming from different walks of lives, with different perspectives, different experiences, and different responsibilities, I'm reminded of Way back a few years when I was still young, in my secondary school, it was a girls' school with very strict rules. I had a teacher who used to inspire us. She was a mature teacher, very strict, but very good. Some of the statements she mentioned to us have carried on and had an impact in my life 
during my everyday work with communities. One of the statements she made was, in, in a bid to try and inspire our young minds to work together for the good of the common good, she mentioned that it is very important that you always remember that I am because we are. We are because I am. Turned out later on that that is a powerful African social philosophy that drives the, 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 the convictions of Africans to try and work together for the common good, that draws and respects the perspectives of different walks of lives, and draws them to see how they can forge ahead to work together. It also turns out, as we discuss disasters, that it's not just an African social philosophy. It's actually a social philosophy. It's, it is a philosophy that we all draw into when we are faced with disasters. It is what drives communities at risk to actually forge ahead together to try and build community resilience. Whether you're from Oklahoma, whether you're from Uganda, whether you're from Guatemala, when disaster strikes, that is the principle we draw onto. I am because we are. Now before us this morning are coming different perspectives from grassroots, from community practitioners that have been organizing around issues of disaster for long. And we've been looking forward to this opportunity to bring to you key things, themes that have been coming up as we work together with communities and what we feel HFA2 should emphasize if community resilience is to be built. Now, this morning together, we are drawn by one particular goal that binds us together, and that is the goal of how does HFA2 reduce disasters in the environment where we all see disasters increasing. Now before us, as, as Andrew introduced, we have facilitating organizations and we have community and grassroots practitioners that have been working on building community resilience. But as our work through the views from the front line and our work through the practitioners of communities, one of the major themes that comes up is that everyday disasters are the ones that are having the greatest impact on the majority of the most at-risk at communities. Everyday disasters are causing greater losses, and yet these are the most unreported. There is no resource for, uh, for flood victims out of flash floods. There is no, no reporting, there is no planning for communities that lose 800 acres over just a stroke of drought or over a stroke of floods. And this is what is impacting majority of the most vulnerable communities. And we are saying that if HFA2 is to make any impact, it has to work out mechanisms to connect with this reality. There is a myth that it is the natural dis large scale disasters that have greater impact. But the reality on the ground, as you'll hear from the voices from the communities, the realities on the ground is that it's the everyday disasters that are having greater economic losses. The second theme that seems to be coming up is that HFA1 has made progress in at national and international level, but there is a great gap between that progress and the front line, the communities most at risk. So we are, the message we are sending here is, as we discuss HFA2, how are we going to ensure that the progress made at policy level, the progress made at international level, actually goes down to the communities who are most affected by these disasters. And, and, and the final thing is that at the heart of the next HFA2, the, it has to be community resilience. So as we stand and discuss this morning, as we hear from the different voices, I would like to challenge us to draw on this principle that if we are to make resilient nations, we have to build resilient communities. And if we are to build resilient communities, then we should put at the forefront this principle, I am because we are. I welcome you to this session as we hear from others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you very much, Anne. And we are now going to turn to some of our panelists. And to help set the scene a little bit um, before we uh, hear from Godavari, there is a short video which will uh, provide us with a little bit of perspective about Godavari's work in India. 
So if we can have the video, please. नाम गोदावरी शिर सागर है और मैं सकी फेडरेशन की सचिव हूँ और ग्रुट्स इंडिया की नेटवर्क के सदस्य हूँ ज़्यादा तो ज़्यादा ये इस टाइम जो दुष्काल है सुखा है तो ये सुखे में इतना पानी कम है जो पिछला दुष्काल था 72 तो ये दुष्काल में ऐसा है कि आनाज है लेकिन पानी नहीं हम देखते हैं कि गांव में जो महिला है अलग गट में नए वाले महिला देखते और गट में क्या देखते जो गट में महिला है को इसको पूरा मालूम चलता है कि वो सुखा क्या है और कितना जनावर के लिए पानी लगता है वो स्कीम कौन सी है ग्राम पंचायत लेवल की है यानी महासंगत उन बरेयत जैसे भी उसाह है कर्ज देना गिना है गटाचर रिकॉर्डिंग शिकवना है यानी व आनी त्याग बरोबरी नामी जेका लीडर महिला तैयार करें जेता मचा तरते लीडर महिला तैयार केला लीडर महिला तैयार केला मुझे आरोग्य मधे लीडर महिला तैयार केला ग्राम पंचायत ले वाला उन लीडर महिला तैयार केला व्यवसाय मधे लीडर महिला तैयार केला यानी कृषि मधे पन तैयार केला तर अत्ता यह सद्या महासंग जेका बाहर जाने जाते हैं कि वो घर में नहीं बैठते, गांव में नहीं बैठते, गांव के बाहर जो परिसर में गांव है, तालुका लेवल है, जिला लेवल है, और बाहर दिल्ली तक हमारे महिला ने जाके और अलग-अलग पंचायत लेवल के जो ट्रेनिंग है इसलिए दिल्ली को गए थे। गुड मॉर्निंग मला है गुड मॉर्निंग मला या कम्युनिटी प्लॉट पर मैं मधे बोलने चाहिए संधि में डाली थे जब मुझे मैं खूब अच्छा आनंद दिए आनी मैं जा ठीक नहीं रहते महाराष्ट्र मधे जा लोग कान मधे रहते तर ती तो खूब मोटा प्रमाण अत्ला दुष्कार है कि त्या दुष्कार है मुझे आनी हाँ दुष्कार है आई स्पीक टू यू माय कम्युनिटी � the silent disaster is overtaking us in the last few years where women are not organized. Entire communities are migrating out and families are selling their livestock and land. We expect it takes many, many years to recover. 20 years ago, we had the major Latur earthquake affecting 200,000 houses and families. Village women's groups were challenged and learned how to access, manage government grants, and repair and construct safe houses and community centers. From this experience, we helped Gujarat women in 2001 and Tsunami in 2004 and years later, organized leadership in rebuilding their lives and livelihoods. We have helped women in many other countries as well. Today, the drought is echoing an old message that a major crisis always brings an opportunity for us to work for resilient development in our communities. Extreme weather changes are affecting our farming and water resources, and they are the most severe threats that we face now. We have to pay for commercialization. Our fields, sugarcane and grape have drained water, and we did get 1,000 feet deep to collect water for drinking. We are assuming roles as federation leaders and decision makers around agriculture and nutrition, what crops we grow, how can we use less water and chemicals to grow them, and how can we ensure that we have nutritious food throughout the drought. Ten years ago, we started organizing our women's movement locally 
of self-help groups and strengthen our livelihoods and enterprises. We build strong partnerships with the government and the private sector. And we have knowledge of agriculture and we have a women's farmers network of 3,000 women locally who cooperate to promote sustainable farming and markets for our food. Our federation leaders have been trained to act as communicators, planners, and technical experts in drought reduction and adaptive farming. With government scientists, we have mapped climate risk in agriculture. With district administration, the federations have held village assemblies to trigger off community drought prevention. These women-led practices that include fodder and grain collection, seed banks, and farming ponds have used employment guarantee programs of the government. We have transferred river bank soil to farms, vastly improving soil quality and saving millions of dollars. To ensure drinking water supplies, federations have worked with local governments to redistribute drinking water through public trans stand posts. We are constantly up updating ourselves. Government agriculture scientists and universities are teaching women farmers new technologies, drip irrigation, how to grow dryland crops, millets, beans, and vegetables to enhance food security and reduce costs in agriculture. We partner with a private energy company who want to market clean energy products and develop Develop grassroots business models that involve village level women entrepreneur networks who sell cookstoves, water filters, solar lamps to community families, reducing women's work time and conserving energy. Managing flexible community resilience funds, federations dedicate money to direct community actions for resilience and support enterprise development with small farmers and landless to cultivate short-term crops and market vegetables to ensure cash in difficult times. They need, they need to ensure cash and meals on the table for their families. The recent news that we are very proud of is the decision to appoint 600 plus federation leaders as drought communicators and advisors in Usmanabad district. This is a first ever partnership allowing us to receive updated weather changes, reach out on time information to provide farmers with guidance on water security, low input agriculture, and other forms of coping. As you have heard, our women federations are not victims or vulnerable groups. However, our communities and families have faced decades of extreme situations challenging our safety and quality of life. At the fourth global platform, we are calling for the HFA2 that leads to policies that will dedicate local funds, reward collaboration between grassroots women's groups, local and district officials, and the private sector. We need your help to create a bottom-up program framework that will hold these actions. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Godavari, for uh, uh, your presentation, the conversation that you've st opened up here. And some of the themes coming out of there are ones which we will really uh, be getting into, this, this idea of partnership 
um, across various different uh, uh, members. This challenge of resources, resources at the local level, and also the impact that is being made by community groups really, really being proactive and, 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 and making things happen. So thank you very much. We, I'm now going to turn to, we're going to go to Fiji. We're going to have a quick uh, visit around the world as we hear from different perspectives. We're going all the way over to Fiji, and I'm going to turn to Juta, who's been doing a lot of work locally, but also collecting, uh, connecting local, national, and regional. So Juta, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, forgive me if, if I'm going to skip the, the formal salutation, because I have only four minutes to speak, and I have four points to share with you this morning. Uh, my challenge this morning is, is to uh, provide a brief overview of the community perspective from Fiji. But Fiji is too far from here, and a lot of you don't know where Fiji is. So I was kind of thinking, well, I'll take you to the airport in Geneva, and then I'll show you how I got here. But the Fiji delegation is here, and, and, and I think our presence is here. Uh, um, if, 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 we, if we go to the marketplace outside, you, you'll see that there's a booth there, and um, it's a, the, the name of the booth is the Pacific Dis Disaster Risk Management Partnership Network. So I thought i will give you a little bit of uh, a different approach so, so I can get you to Fiji. So from, from this uh, Pacific Disaster Risk Management uh, Pacific Networks, it involves um, a members uh, like government, government representatives from the NDMO, National D Disaster Management Office, the Ministry of Finance and other sectors. Uh, we have the UN agencies who are there in the Pacific. We have the, uh, some of the regional universities, civil society uh, organizations that are working in the Pacific and private sectors and including media. So these are the group of people and organizations who are part of this uh, Pacific uh, Disaster Risk Management Partnership uh, Network. So under this network, uh, we have thematic working groups. So, uh, for example, we have the training and capacity building working groups. Uh, we have the mainstreaming working group. We have the preparedness and early warning system. And uh, one of the working groups under this uh, regional partnership network is the community-based disaster risk management working group. So, um, in Fiji, most of uh, the civil society that are, that are working in Fiji are also part of this uh, regional working group, the CBDRM working group. So in, in our effort in, in, in trying to, to improve how we deliver our programs at the community level, well, what we have done in, in, in Fiji is we've, we have coordinated some of our efforts in delivering uh, our, our projects at the community level. For example, because when we look around the, the, within the, the civil society sector that are doing disaster risk management and uh, DRR, I mean DRR work in, in in, the, in Fiji, uh, there's only a few of us, and there's about more than 300 communities to cover. Uh, so um, what, what we've done is that, that we pulled in our, our resources, our expertise together, so that we can be able to, um, to, share, to share our expertise and, and resources to be able to effectively uh, reach out to all our communities there at home. So, um, for example, I'll give you a brief, uh, a short example. Uh, so one of our uh, one of our NGOs in Fiji, they are particularly good of setting up of community disaster committees. So what they do, they, they go through, they work with the communities uh, in, in assessing their, their risk and, and then uh, doing planning and they're coming up and then at the end of that they come up with their community action plans. In the same process, they develop uh, community disaster committees which have representatives of all uh, sectors of the communities, women, men, um, uh, and, and, uh, and the elderly and the youths. So these disaster committees are linked to the local government and also to the NDMO office in, in, and they are trained in initial damage assessment process. So when a disaster strikes, so these community members of these disaster committees are deployed to collect the information of the damages that are incurred by a particular, their community. So that is an example. So what we did, using that um, uh, the strength of that particular NGO and work with other civil society within the country. One example of the uh, collaboration is the work that was done by the, the Persons with Disability Organization in Fiji. They work, current, at the moment, they're working with, uh, uh, with this um, uh, NGO in, in trying to fuse in some of these uh, disaster management and, and preparedness and re response approaches into the, 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 their work with the disability group. So at the moment, they're developing a, tool, a toolkit. 
So it, it, it's, a, it's a two phase approach. The other organization brings in the expertise to, to influence the, 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 um, the people with disability organization. At the same time, this particular organization have built the capacity in working with people with disability. So they're mainstreaming uh, people with disability in their own work as well. All right, so this kind of example um, has, has really uh, given, given us a, 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 a lot of evidence, a lot of evidence of collaboration at the community level. And, and, and this is um, how we've, we've come to, uh, to one of the, the conclusions that, that we need to have a much more integrated, much more interagency collaboration at, at the local level. And it, and it speaks to, to what we do at the national, the regional, and international level as well. So um, we think that the HFA too, in, in, in this respect, should, should look into this. Some of, the, some of the integration and collaboration are already happening down there at the community level. All right, um, my next point is, um, in, in, in the views from the front line, 2013, even though some of these collaborations are working out really well, when, when we did the views of the front line in Fiji and in other Pacific Island countries as well, what was coming through um, from, from the findings is that inclusivity remains to be, the, to be a challenge. Inclusion of vulnerable groups remains to be a challenge in our tiny Pacific Island countries. So we had some, some discussions and, and, and consultations around that. Why, why do we still have this problem with us? Why? So in, in that discussions, what came through with that, for example, in, 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 the, in go local government and national government planning, one of the things that lacking uh, that we identified in that process, when we look at uh, uh, children, for example, you know, the definition of children in, 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 some, in most of our Pacific Island countries are different. And within, within uh, each, in gov each government as well, and in, in each, across the sectors, definition, definition of children is different. So this kind of in, inconsistencies in, in data uh, aggregation, it, it affects effective planning. And this is, exact, uh, uh, in that discussion, that we identified, okay, this is exactly why vulnerable groups, their priorities are not linked into sectoral planning and, and priorities as well. That, that's, why, that's, that's where the disconnection lies. And, and we need to change the approach. So we feel that, that in the FHA, FHA HFA2, there needs to be a focus to, to commit governments and re relevant stakeholders to forge partnerships and develop a much more um, inclusive approach in their DRR and, and uh, programming efforts. Okay, um, my last point, I'll, I'll take you back home to Fiji. In our hurricane season starts in, in, in October. So what normally, uh, what normally happens is that uh, there, there's always a, 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 um, an initiative uh, led by communities, um, CSOs, and in our NDMO office in, in uh, raising awareness across the, across the country. We have uh, five, uh, four, sorry, four divisions in Fiji. So for the last couple of years, we have managed to uh, um, do awareness programs across the four divisions in Fiji, uh, working with, with local communities, uh, CSOs, the media, um, uh, and in that process as well, they, we have simulation exercise of, of how people respond to tsunami, respond to floods and, and, um, and hurricanes. So that has been an ongoing activity uh, year in and year out. Um, lastly, uh, I just want to um, share a, a short story with you before I end my four minutes. Sorry, Andrea. Okay. In, in last year, in 2011, in 2012, uh, sorry, Fiji was hit back to back by two floods, one in January and another one, I think, in March. Yeah. And, and as we were just recovering from those two floods, and then we were hit again by another cyclone, just, be, just as we were approaching Christmas in December. So you can imagine the, you know, the, 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 the amount of, uh, of, of work and, and people still coming out, recovering from, from the flood, and then hit again by the, by the hurricane. I mean, it's too much, yeah? So, but 
in um, following following um, the tropical cyclone Evan in, in December, um, the, the government prepared a, a post disaster needs assessment report with the support of the World Bank and SPC uh, SOPEC. In in, uh, in that report, the, the impact of, of cyclone Evans on the economy was estimated to result in a 0.4 percent decline in the current growth forecast for 2014. So in, in basic, uh, in basic, in common language of community discussion term, the, the disaster losses that was incurred from the destruction of tropical cyclone Evan was the highest in the history of disaster losses incurred by hurricane in Fiji. It was the highest. But there was a silver lining. In that disaster, there was no lives lost. No one died. Even though we incurred the most amount of losses ever, but no one died. When we compared the same cyclone hit Samoa, 16, 16 lives were believed to have died from the same cyclone in Samoa. But in Fiji, no one died. So for us, for us in Fiji, we think, man, we must have done something right. So this is kind of a clear indication for us of our community resilience in Fiji. And it's, it's, it's a step towards pro, uh, progress that we can work away with. And, and, and the thing is, you know, it, it gives everyone involved in this work uh, a great comfort to know that all our hard work is not wasted. It can be rewarding with this kind of accomplishment. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and Thank you, Victor. Thank you very much. And many of those themes we'll be exploring more, but I want to go straight over to Nicaragua. Uh, and let's hear from Heidi with a perspective from uh, Nicaragua. Heidi. Thank you very much. I am the president of the Union of Cooperatives of Las Brumas, which brings together 20 basic cooperatives and four collectives, with a total of 1,320 agriculture women who are members of a global network. We produce basic crops, corn, beans, small-scale coffee, garden vegetables, small poultry, and cattle. We have diversified organic plots of land with non-traditional crops, such as cocoa. We produce this in our diversified area, and this uh, ensures our community's food security. We also work on disaster risk reduction. The three phases of this are before, during, and after, and we take into account in this regard the five points of the HIOGO framework of action. So we work in coordination with a center for the prevention of natural disasters in Central America called CEPREDENAC. We have a platform of community-based experts in resilience. We protect ecosystems. We engage in reforestation. We try to identify areas of vulnerability to threats using community mapping for risk. We as women also work on early alert. This is an ancestral practice. We look at our rivers. We examine the rivers to see the extent of uh, disasters which may be about to occur. In terms of political participation, we also engage in training and dissemination of information to women on uh, political involvement and human rights. We build alliances and we forge partnerships with local authorities. This has been very difficult. This has been a long process. But we as women are tenacious. We're happy to be determined and have our voices heard and have our work recognized. I'd like, in light of that, to mention a number of our achievements in 
for instance, in the municipality of Wiwi, which is uh, around 250 kilometers from Ginoteo. We have this place, Wiwi. And with that municipality, we've had 5% of the local authority's budget assigned to our work in social projects for women. Examples of this are education, health, and agriculture. So all of this is achieved through a, an agreement which we've signed with women's cooperatives and the local authorities. So we've had the uh, recognition of one local authority, and we hope to gain further recognition elsewhere over the course of the years to come. We've been es establishing three gender-based committees as well to influence committee community women's interests, and we've managed to bolster political participation of women through advocacy. 30 more women are now present in four different municipal structures, and they now have key strategic positions in the public authority, so they can influence infrastructure, governance, and social affairs. A municipal document is now being discussed uh, to uh, legislate on this uh, relationship between women and the local authorities. So we can't work alone. We need to work together. We need to pool our resources, forge alliances with municipal authorities, and forge ahead with our work. Thank you. And we have a short video from Nicaragua to bring some of those themes uh, into pictures. If we can have the video, please. Bueno, la, la parte eh, del trabajo municipal es bastante complejo. Primeramente por la gran demanda que existe eh, de la elaboración de proyectos. Pero nosotros consideramos que para poder desarrollar los proyectos hay que organizarse. Comenzamos a ir buscando alianza con los gobiernos, no los querían atender, nos peleábamos. Nosotros salíamos llorando y nos peleábamos. Después dijimos no. Vamos a utilizar otra estrategia. Cuando lo, los gobiernos estaban en campaña, y se, nosotros les decían, bueno, vamos a hacer alianza con ustedes, con, que se comprometen, fírmelo aquí. Para elaborar lo que es el presupuesto municipal se hace una encuesta en las comunidades. Nos reunimos con Celso para plantearle que si él llegaba a ser el alcalde, que, que nos prometía, y él nos prometió un 5% del presupuesto municipal para apoyar los proyectos de las mujeres. Bueno, nosotros también en, en la consulta tomamos en cuenta que en las partes rurales la mayor parte de la población que se reúne son las mujeres. Entonces, la mujer como es la que comienza pues, la actividad en el hogar, eh, son las que trabajan también el campo. La mujer Under la the National Disaster Risk Management Program, Entonces, we have achieved the road radio results over the Como la mujer last la que few years, el agua para la casa, which we have también. reflected Entonces, in the HFA progress report, paper based on the HFA portable. monitored template, Entonces, un 5 and submitted to UNICDR eh, Regional la, Office for Africa. A las to highlight lo some of the recent, the recent key achievements, to strengthen early warning and emergency se tiene que ir incrementando we have set up early warning and emergency centers which will soon be adelante. fully operational around the y una vez trabajando desde la base, we have also recently inaugurated the African regional, Center nacional, no for Disaster Risk Management which has successfully run it is first de la, de international en una master course on Disaster Risk Management in April this year. 
porque hemos venido haciendo las escalas y escalas hasta que ahora tengamos un buen trabajo en el local, en advancing the disaster risk management agenda. Nacional, regional Our disaster risk profiling work, a foundation for designing targeted disaster risk reduction plans and contextualizing early warning response system for local Thank levels. Thank you, Heidi. Is also key word that came out there, tenacity. Well, currently covering nearly 300 districts. That, that you use there As part of our of really effort to move there. away well, thank you very much. We'll be exploring from that. a bi-seasonal we'll assessment business okay, we're move from Nicaragua to a to continuous Rica. monitoring system so, based approach, um, we I'd have recently launched the level of early assessment and protection, LIP tool, which will allow us to project drought-induced risk well ahead of time. And we will start with a short with video from Costa Rica, and then Jacqueline will make some, uh, uh, some of the headlines. So over to Costa Rica, please. In our whistle-stop tour around the world, here we go. Okay. Reportes de la CNE informa que el río Sarapiquí continúa desbordado. La cuenca del río Sarapiquí es una de las 34 cuencas principales que tiene, que tiene Costa Rica. Se ubica en la vertiente norte del, del país y está conformada por la subcuenca del río Sarapiquí propiamente, la del río Puerto Viejo y la del río Sucio. alerta temprana lo que busca es eso, informar a la población con suficiente tiempo para que puedan tomar las acciones necesarias para disminuir la cantidad de pérdidas que se puedan generar a partir de unas inundaciones eh, o un evento extremo cualquiera. Una vez con toda la información recopilada, tanto el pronóstico del tiempo como el pronóstico hidrológico, esto lo plamamos en un documento que se llama aviso meteorológico. Este documento es enviado a la Comisión Nacional de Emergencias, en donde a partir de ahí, ellos comienzan los procesos de alertar a la población en la cuenca del Sarapiquí. El IMN recomienda precaución en los lugares en donde se presentan inundaciones cerca del río Sarapiquí, tanto en Ciudad Puerto Viejo como en lugares cercanos al río. Y a partir de este momento se declara alerta roja para toda la cuenca del Sarapiquí. Con este proyecto lo que hemos pretendido es que todo ese cúmulo de información, todo ese cúmulo de productos altamente técnicos se transmitan a las comunidades en lenguaje sencillo, de manera que las personas que están al final de la cadena puedan tomar decisiones y acciones de acuerdo con esa información que les está llegando. Bueno, yo he pasado todas las inundaciones aquí en el Naranjal. Tener un comité de emergencia nos sirve mucho porque es que así cuando hay alguna inundación ya sabemos que hay a quién recurrir. Como que hay una costumbre de que todo tiene que darse, ¿no? todo tiene que hacerse. ¿no? Entonces yo les decía a ellos que ahora esta experiencia es bonita porque aprendemos de que no solamente es que nos den, que no solamente que nos manden, que nos hagan, sino que nos tenemos que aportar también. Se le informa al pueblo de Naranjal que se presentó una emergencia. Por favor, llegar a la iglesia, a su amor. Sin la participación entusiasta y el apoyo enorme obtenido de las instituciones y las comunidades en este proyecto, Creo que hubiera sido muy difícil obtener los resultados tan positivos que hemos logrado. Lo más importante en un proyecto de estos es evidenciar cómo las capacidades locales deben ser fortalecidas para que haya una efectiva gestión del riesgo. Para eso se requiere la confluencia de las instituciones científico-técnicas con información práctica que pueda ser llevada a las comunidades para que ellos lo puedan entender y asimilar.
morning. Good morning to all of you. We have an early warning project which was uh, begun in Heredia province and uh, in one of the biggest uh, areas in that province. And there are a number of uh, main areas to mention here. Firstly, we organize local groups. We train organizations in what action has to be taken. Secondly, we coordinate state institutions and private businesses, along with emergency committees to uh, prepare for events. Thirdly, we save lives. We uh, ensure that families can go to shelters before the risk occurs. We have uh, shelters which are flagged up and uh, the way to the shelters is also flagged up. We also have a culture of uh, risk awareness and danger awareness so that we can act in an uh, early fashion. Fi fa fifthly, we uh, empower the communities involved in committees to ensure that individuals in communities can be involved in this early warning process. I believe that in our communities, we want to uh, reproduce this positive experience in Heredia elsewhere, and we'd also like to spread our practices across the world. In the uh, Sarapiki Basin, we've had a great deal of success. We've got a sense of trust because support from uh, various different institutions which are involved in this type of thing. And we've got some very valuable information and some valuable resources to be able to back our efforts. So there's trust among the people. and. Uh, their lives as agricultures and uh, people involved in the tourism industry as well have been able to carry on as normal. We think this is a very valuable experience and we'd like to share it at the international level so that we can uh, manage to avoid or reduce the effects of floods. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay, and then uh, uh, we're going to move straight over now to Uganda, uh, and we are, we are going to have a, a, a final perspective from the community before we hear from some uh, uh, government voices, so some government perspectives from, from the panel. So over to Anne from Uganda um, to provide a perspective of what's going on uh, in her part of the world, and we'll start there with a very short video just to help set the scene from Uganda. Thank you. The problems that local people face is first and foremost poverty, specifically relating to the urban poor. What happens is they find themselves in uh, cheap areas, which is really areas that are prone to fl flooding. Even the slightest rain causes massive flooding. When it floods, the, the water goes to that level of chain. She has to remove the lower baby who slips down to the upper one uh, to survive. There are massive problems of sanitation. Schools have to mop filthy water in the morning, so people spend a lot of hours doing that. And some of the schools have been closed. But when it comes to waking up every morning in a flooded household and doing something about it, Government is not there because the local government does not have the capacity, financial capacity, the human resource capacity to deal with those issues. So as a result, people are left to fend and think for themselves. The people have tried within their means to innovate. They have tried bylaws local bylaws to regulate cleaning and some hygiene. We've been teaching people on how to manage their garbage within their vicinities, not to dump them in the water streams. So the biggest challenge is the approach that governments use to solicit views from the communities. And you find that the very poor who face the core issues are missing out. We want a global framework that is not imposing an agenda to the people. We want a global framework that comes to build on the local solutions. Real change takes place on the ground.
Damn. Okay, I think I think that is uh, a classic example of the everyday disasters we are talking about and the majority how it affects the majority of the most vulnerable women, children, and so I'm not going to dwell more on the problems, but I'm going to dwell more on the recommendations that we think we can take forward as we think on how to forge uh, a better and resilient planet. Uh, one of the things that comes uh, clearly is that listening to all the voices is that communities are not sitting. Communities are organizing themselves and creating innovative solutions to their problems. And the message we are bringing forth to this house is that can HFA for, can, can HFA to develop mechanisms to tap into those local capacities? Can HFA to work out processes that connect the policy development, the programming, to the knowledge which is in the communities and the innovations which are in the communities so that they can be scaled up? That is one of the lessons that we learned. The second lesson that we learned is that the primary stakeholders or respondents to disasters is actually local government and local governance. And we, real, we have seen that while we have made progress at the national level, while we've made progress at the international level, the local governance is actually incapacitated to respond spot on on these issues. So we think that HFA2 has to actually invest in building the capacities of local governance so that they can respond to the local priorities of the communities. The last thing that I will share and recommend is that we have seen that disasters is something that cannot be done as a standalone. It is not something that only one specific group has to respond to. It needs and requires a collection of different efforts, different practices, different expertise for us to actually forge resilient communities. We have seen communities organizing. We have seen civil societies mobilizing and facilitating communities. We see private sector in the system. We see local government. So we are recommending that HFA2 builds and develops mechanisms to strengthen partnerships for us to build resilient communities. And the last message we give here is that there are no resilient nations without resilient communities. And there will be no resilient planet without resilient nations. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. OK, we're going to widen that conversation. And now, now um, continuing uh, with Uganda, um, we're delighted that the Honorable Alex Bakunda is joining us here. Um, and I'd invite you, uh, uh, Alex, to, to respond and, and, and to tell us a little about your perspective uh, from the Uganda uh, challenges and situation. Thank you. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, honorable colleagues, members of parliament here present, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to make one quick correction that one, I was introduced as a chairperson. Among many other roles I play in parliament of Uganda, I'm actually not a chairman of the uh, Climate Change Committee or Forum for that matter. I'm a chairperson of the Disaster Risk Resistant uh, Forum in the Parliament of Uganda. And uh, it was the very first one in that whole entire region, sub-region. So, and it has about 84 members of parliament. So that is what I do in parliament, in addition to my other roles. That notwithstanding, uh, distinguished delegates, in this interaction, I would like us to ask ourselves the following questions. One, how do we develop community capacities to withstand disasters uh, in a disaster situations? Two, how do we build community-based approaches in a DRR? Three, how do we engage communities at a policy level in dealing with the disaster challenges? Those are, to me, those are three very important questions we must put at the back of our minds as we go on into this interaction. As already indicated, Uganda has a disaster management and preparedness policy, which was adopted way back 
in 2010. As you have also been shown, Uganda is prone to both natural and human induced disasters, mostly what you saw, floods, landslides, drought in some cases, but uh, otherwise Uganda would be, they call it actually the pearl of Africa, the pearl of Africa, but we still have those disasters as well. The Ugandan parliament of course considers these issues very serious development and hence the formation of the forum and enactment of our preparedness policy way back in 2010. We have, of course, as I indicated, a parliamentary forum with a membership of 84 members, and I do chair that uh, forum. Between 1980, about three years ago, about 61 ma major disasters have occurred, uh, leading to about 640 deaths, and uh, we have registered an estimated loss of about 73 million US dollars. That's colossal when you look at the poverty levels in our country. It's a huge amount of money to us. The, the major disasters, of course, are already clear. There are drought, outbreaks of disease, low onset of floods, floods, landslides, hailstorms, lightning, earthquakes, epidemics of both human and animals. You've heard about them. Fire, construction, and what have you. Uh, there are quite many, but they are also very devastating. Communities and the DRR, one, Disasters, by the way, you all must know, from so far what I have gathered, disasters are not neutral at all. They disproportionately impact on the very poor, you've seen it. They impact very seriously on the disabled, the children, the minority groups, the marginalized groups, and most of all, the women, you all saw it, very clear. To note also is that communities are very complex and they are often not united due to disparities in wealth, social status, or even religion. They even, but however, they are very dynamic. You saw one part of Kampala, the worst part of it, where it floods almost every year until we got out of our way and said, no, enough is enough. I wish she had shown the other part of the story now because of those small channels you saw, government had to invest a lot much more. We insisted. We pumped in a lot of money, and now the, a big channel has been put up, and uh, we expect it's not yet over, with, of course, funding from World Bank and what have you. And we expect that come next rain season, we're not likely to experience such a heavy flooding in that part of the area. I'm glad she has told me she has been there. She must have seen that construction of a very big, much bigger, stronger, deeper channel to collect all those waters. Communities, of course, possess potential knowledge for disaster management. You've seen it also on their own without sometimes any intervention whatsoever. Uh, why should we put communities uh, at the forefront? Because if you apply local knowledge and skills and capacities, you are sure of having very permanent solutions in as far as some of these problems are concerned. There are many roles, of course, communities can play in the form of planning, relocation. When there are these floods, they can play a role. They also can play a role in the land use regulation. You saw plot number this and this. They didn't know what to do about it, yet they could have used it maybe to do something better if they were also involved. But sometimes we in the government tend to think that they don't know. But me, I'm saying it's important that, that they should be involved in as far as land use regulation is concerned. They can also, uh, they have a role so in hazard mapping, they have a role in education, information sharing. They can, take play, they, they can also take part in drills, drill them how they should be uh, react in the case of uh, a disaster. Early warning, it's so interesting to know that these people really used to know when season A would come how big it would be, how, what impact it would have. Looking at the immigration of birds alone, the local people will tell you that come up, within about two, three weeks, we are going to have a flood or heavy storms, so you see birds fl flying away. They used to know this, but their knowledge is dying out. We think science is a, a solution to all. Challenges in the building community resilience in DRM. One, the biggest challenge is poverty. Most of these people you saw, 
are poverty-stricken communities. Two, inadequate legislation. We have legislation, yes. We have policies, yes. But are they implemented? Are they uh, translated into action? That is one of other challenges. And it to local based knowledge in DRR. I have just mentioned that we, we, we know our grandfathers, our elders in, in society have some information. Do we ever consult them? In most cases, we don't. Uh, community DRM committees are largely non-existent. A few come out as volunteers, but in most cases, they are not there. Even when they are there, it, it takes time to organize them. Lack of integration of community action plans into local government plans. There is now some positive actions being made. You saw how they were saying, look here, we would like our local, our local government to get more money so that they inculcate these other plans into our local plans as well. Lack of insurance schemes. In Africa, I think, it's not only in Uganda, these ones are a thing that is alien. It's not there. It's not, it has not reached there. This risk, the, the risk we call them risk transfer mechanisms. They, they are virtually absent, and uh, the sooner maybe we start developing them, the better. How do we support community resilience? You and me, one, we should support community with the legislation. Something that is applicable, something that is implementable, something that is all embracing. Have these communities uh, taken part in formulation of these all it is top bottom instead of bottom up. Improve on local based knowledge through research. Improved knowledge through research. Look, you improve on what is already available, uh, as I had uh, earlier on indicated. Transfer resilience knowledge to next generation. Do we, after here, do we keep this knowledge you have acquired and just forget? Is the next generation aware of what we are doing? They say, if Knowledge is the only resource on earth that multiplies on subdivision without losing any. If I have knowledge about an issue and I don't share it out, it actually becomes stale. If I share it out, it becomes much better, beautiful, and very pr profitable. So share out this knowledge. Build on community efforts in risk management, risk transfer. That one, insurance schemes, for instance, and that, uh, that what have you. In Uganda, we have uh, a program of having local banks. We call them circles sub, uh, at a very low community level. I think it's through this that government actually is planning to pump in some money uh, by way of helping the poor access easy loans and maybe uh, that element of uh, of risk management and risk transfer could partake from that arrangement. And of course, the most important, education in schools is extremely very essential. What is the role of you and me, members of parliament, those of you members of parliament, the elected officials who are here? What's your role in all this? One, you can allocation, appropriation of funds to support the RM community action plans. There are major, three major roles of a member of parliament. One, to, to represent his or her people. They are the only people that represent people's voices on earth. And there are, these, there are over 45,000 members of parliament in the whole world. Supposing they all went out with one voice and said, no, enough is enough. We should allocate more resources to this subject matter. Support community-driven DRR initiatives, another factor. You, are you a representative of the people? Are you driving their in, uh, views? Are you driving their interests? First of all, you are supposed to legislate. You are supposed to represent. You are supposed to allocate resources. And you are supposed to oversee the executive, what they do. Activation of DRS structures at local level and make them operational. Three, assist in legislation, enforcement of bylaws that address the underlying causes and dynamic pressures that vulnerable communities face. Five, integration of the other climate change, adapt climate change adaptation issues into school curriculum at primary and secondary levels. Five, uh, six, promote local-based community DRR knowledge. Seven, 
We should also support a culture of preparedness where training and evacuation drills are systematically practiced at the community level and most especially in schools so that our younger generation grows up knowing what to do and at what time. There are many more I would have said, but because of time, I would like to end up here. But finally, my final message is HFA2 should build community capacity to develop homegrown solutions. Two, the involvement of elected leaders is a must, not an alternative. I've told you about their numbers. This is a critical mass that should be utilized to take far, wider, deeper this agenda. Succeed, we must. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for uh, sharing those challenges to the room, sharing those challenges for, for different people in the room, different stakeholders in the room, all playing a role in this. Okay, I'm going to turn now to uh, Minister uh, Kay, if I can, to provide a perspective from New Zealand and picking up on some of the themes that we've uh, been hearing about so far. Thank you. Hard am I, hard am I. Good morning. Uh, look, firstly, can I just acknowledge uh, not only the panellists that are here today, but also everybody in the room that is working whatever field you're working in to strengthen community resilience. As an elected representative, uh, and what I intend to talk to you about is uh, more than ever we realise as a country in New Zealand the importance of uh, community groups, of non-governmental organisations and their role in building community resilience. In fact, the story of Canterbury is actually a wonderful story of, I think, uh, communities mobilising uh, to help people. So I intend to just give you a quick uh, overview of New Zealand's uh, civil defence system. I think the principles of it uh, really are about mobilising and activating uh, communities to be able to both uh, mitigate uh, risks but also to mobilise in the event of a major emergency. And I want to give you that little bit of a snapshot in terms of what we were dealing with in Canterbury and then talk you through uh, the reviews that we've had and what that's shown in terms of community resilience, some of the lessons learned and where we need to strengthen our civil defence system. So we're a nation of four million people. In fact, at the SIDS session yesterday, I said we're a small developed nation, but we have many of the profiles in terms of hazards as small island developing nations. So we don't have a whole lot of people in terms of civil defence to rely on when something goes wrong. In fact, 80% of our civil defence workforce is volunteers. And what happened in Canterbury was we had a major disaster. 170,000 out of 185,000 of our houses were damaged. So what we were dealing with was 90% uh, of houses damaged. We were dealing with 20% of our uh, GDP, which is a lot for a developed nation, and it is a remarkable story in terms of uh, what happened around the community response. And let me give you a snapshot of that. So in the aftermath, most of the res rescues were actually made by people close by. So the help was provided by neighbours, existing community groups, churches and voluntary organisations. Uh, and what that underlined for us is our basic principles of a framework in New Zealand, our framework is that local government has responsibility for developing plans. We have a small centralised authority, uh, which is the New Zealand uh, Emergency Management and Civil Defence team. It's actually about 30 people. And what happened is uh, the community kicked in and actually was there on the ground both in terms of self-activation, self-sufficiency, self-responsibility and self-management were key principles that came out in terms of the community response. Uh, essentially, we did a number of reviews and actually the, the, really the, the results of those reviews were to say that uh, our principles are sound in terms of community resilience, in terms of having a framework that operates at a local government level 
but there are areas where we as a government need to better support our volunteers. Uh, that is in terms of training of volunteers. And there also are areas whereby the centralised authority does need to uh, strengthen its capability. So I'll just give you a bit of a snapshot of some of that. So in terms of the, the volunteer workforce, what became very clear out of Canterbury is that we had a huge number of spontaneous volunteers. And what we found was that was wonderful in terms of the clean-up, liquefaction. Uh, we saw the student army uh, kick in, a group of young people mobilising. But what we also found is that when you don't, when someone turns up with a shovel to that centralised uh, group and you can't uh, provide them with a role, then you can very quickly, uh, I think, uh, reduce your capability in terms of the response. So that was a key lesson that came out of it. We also found that there are certain areas of our civil defence system where we do need to have greater training for volunteers. We also saw, I think, that certain parts of our communities had uh, a lot of strength in terms of the groups, but there were other parts that didn't. So vulnerable people was an area where we definitely saw in the aftermath of Canterbury that we need to strengthen. I think some of the lessons that we actually did a formal evaluation specifically around um, community resilience. And I think uh, one of the lessons that we learnt was that there were some traits around those spontaneous groups, both in terms of can-do attitude, strong local knowledge and connections, a readiness to listen to what the community needed, and a strong sense of commitment to helping others. So when we are looking at how we're going to strengthen in the future, we're looking at some of those principles in terms of backing those community groups that really um, stepped up in terms of leadership. We also know the value of partnerships, uh, and I'm going to talk about the recovery in a second around um, the value of uh, both the speed of the recovery and the importance of getting community buy-in in terms of that recovery. Uh, some other lessons that came out of Canterbury, good communication and feedback supported by robust Im information networks using multiple ch channels that, to uh, provide that feedback. So you know, one of the big uh, themes of the Canterbury response was the use of social media. And one of my priorities as minister is to both ensure that we mobilise more youth in New Zealand in terms of uh, their involvement in volunteering, but also we mobilise social media in terms of the response, but also pulling back information from a government perspective that will enable us to help uh, those hotspots where there are issues that are going on. Uh, we also saw the value of trusting and respecting local initiatives and organic responses. To quote one recipient uh, and one participant, no one knows a community better than the people that work and play within it. Uh, we saw the value of investing in certain community groups as a result of Canterbury. So I think what we've learnt is that as a small nation, the irony is you don't have a lot of people in terms of your civil defence emergency management. But the 40 years that we've spent refining that approach to really back local communities, to have a civil defence framework that has a local plan that, it, that backs communities to know hazards better than a centralised authority, is actually fundamentally sound. And we are working, for instance, in the Pacific with our Pacific neighbours uh, who have the same profile effectively of us uh, to work with them to strengthen their system, uh, particularly in terms of uh, community resilience. So I think uh, what we've learnt out of Canterbury is that we've got to strengthen those areas that will both incentivise community groups, that will strengthen our volunteer uh, workforce, that will enable uh, in the aftermath of responses in particular to mobilise more community groups and more individuals because as we saw in Canterbury, the remarkable story is that really things like rescues, cleanups, it's really the community that steps in uh, to assist. I think the, the, the final point that I would make is that uh, from the experience that we've had in Canterbury and from many international partners wanting to look at our principles of civil defence, we've actually seen an organic response grow into other parts of New Zealand. So you may be interested to know that our capital city, Wellington, has been chosen as one of 10 cities globally to participate in the United Nations Habitat City Resilience Profiling Programme. 
Uh, Wellington is a city that straddles two major earthquake fault lines. It's also exposed to a wide range of other hazards, including flooding, landslides and storm surges. Uh, so the Wellington Region Emergency Management Office has been actively working to support community-driven preparedness across the region. They've also managed to build the largest following on Facebook and Twitter for an emergency management office in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, I'd like to mention two quick lines or, and examples of their work. The Tsunami Blue Lines program has won two, national awards, two international awards for public awareness. This involves painting lines on roads and footpaths so that people know what level to evacuate in the event of a tsunami uh, alert. And I think the success of the program really, and not only its impact, but is that it's community driven. So as a government, we are really looking to back those initiatives that are working. Finally, in terms of recovery, look, it's really hard. We've had to basically demolish our central city in Christchurch. We have a thousand buildings uh, that are being demolished. And I, I think at this point, as a political leader, uh, the one thing that I would say, and I think the importance of, particularly at a time where we're two years in, we're seeing huge mental strain around people in terms of social issues in Canterbury. There are some decisions that have to be made centrally. And uh, when it comes to rebuilding really critical infrastructure, and I see that Roger Sutton is here, our head of the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority, there are some really hard decisions that have to be made, and our Minister for Canterbury Earthquake Recovery has had to make a number of really hard decisions. And I think what we are learning is, generally, the community will back you. They understand that it's better to um, sometimes make those hard decisions to enable the community to move on in certain areas. But it really is important to have those partnerships in terms of the rebuild because one of the areas that I'm obviously also responsible for is youth, and we know that they, um, there are a lot of young people that want to be involved in that rebuild, and it's going to be really important to get them involved, because then they take ownership of future events, they take ownership of the infrastructure that we build. So that's a really core area that we're working on. It's hard in terms of the rebuild. And I think, um, uh, finally, I would just say that you know, we've been through a lot, but as I said yesterday in both the country statement but also uh, op the opening ceremony, out of this tragedy, uh, we see the best of, and we saw the best of New Zealanders. We saw humanity at its best. And the thing that I have learned from talking to many people across this platform is in the most horrific circumstances, People step up, and that is why we must do more at a global uh, level to strengthen community resilience, to back those communities, to enable people to step up and give them greater opportunities to help people. Uh, so look, it's a privilege to be elect an elected representative, and it's a privilege, I always say, to serve. And I just uh, have huge respect for all of you that are serving communities across the globe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Kaifel, sharing not just some of the challenges, but also some of the success factors uh, and some of the learning and, and lessons along that way. So we're going to uh, have our final stop in our tour uh, around the world in different perspectives. And we're going to go to Brazil, and then I'm going to open it up to some questions, some, some themes, uh, some points that you want, might want to raise from the floor. So we're going to hear from uh, Marcio from Rio de Janeiro. Over to you, Marcio. Thank you very much, Andrew. Regina, my, my, help me to, to build my, my presentation. Good morning, everybody. I'm Marcio Mota, Subsecretary of Civil Defense. This here, my, my name is a uh, little mistake. I'm not Colonel, I'm Lieutenant Colonel. Sorry, Colonel Simões. <laughs> yeah. Who has ever been to Rio de Janeiro here? Great, great, great. It's a wonderful and still complex city. In 2010, we had to deal with a really tough situation. The city suffered the most intense rain in 24 hours. 
within the last decades. 67 people died due to landslides. We have learned a lot with this remarkable disaster. And since then, Mayor Eduardo Paes has increased the city's effort towards resilience. I will share with you some actions that we have done. If you have some, some questions, I will be available uh, at the end of this, the, the session. First, build an operation center to coordinate the work of 30 agents. Its chief uh, is here with us, Pedro Junqueira. Stand up, please. Second, mapping risk area. Third, purchase a weather radar. Fourth, install an early warning system in 103 communities. Last year, our system was among us in top 10 best system of the world. This system of the early warning system. Fifth, the Civil Defense and Brazilian Red Cross have trained around 5,000 community health workers. Uh, look at the picture. Uh, this is our Blue Army. Uh, I call them the Blue Army. Uh, sixth, simulated evacuation of people who live in a high risk area. Seventh, slope containment. Eighth, Introduce in the public school the knowledge of civil defense, environment, first aid, and train evacuation. Please, Bill, let's, let's, hear, let's watch the, the clip. Alunos de escolas públicas do Rio estão passando por um treinamento que ensina como agir durante temporais e enchentes. As orientações podem salvar vidas. Tiago se disfarça de idoso. Isabelle ganha uma barriga de grávida e Michael Douglas está pronto para interpretar um ferido. Os alunos do quinto ano têm várias responsabilidades neste simulado. Eles representam moradores da comunidade que receberam treinamento e atuam como agentes de saúde, da defesa civil e também assistentes sociais. Eles vão organizar e liderar a saída das turmas do primeiro ao quarto ano. E aí, todo mundo preparado? Sim! A escola fica na favela do Borel, zona norte do Rio. Uma das mais de 40 comunidades que tem um sistema de alarme quando há risco de deslizamento. Com calma, os monitores começam a percorrer as salas. Somos da saúde e viemos atirar nos pontos de apoio. Não esqueçam do documento e o remédio. Casais com crianças de colo têm prioridade, assim como pessoas com necessidades especiais e os mais velhos. Em cada tenda, os agentes comunitários fazem uma chamada. E se faltar alguém? Nós comunicaremos os familiares. Se a pessoa não for encontrada, ligaremos para o telefone de emergência. O barulho é de chuva forte e trovões. A escola é mesmo um ponto de apoio para temporais. E Matheus leva a sério a interpretação de um deficiente visual em perigo. Se a gente continuasse em casa, a gente ia poder risco de morrer. São momentos onde as pessoas entram em pânico. E a criança, sabendo o que fazer, ela ajuda a orientar a sua família para que nada saia errado. De norte a sul do país, as chuvas provocam tragédias. E as prefeituras não precisam de muitos recursos para fazer treinamentos como este. Isso não custa nada, basta apenas serem orientados e participar do treinamento. Natural hazards won't stop. In fact, because of the climate change and global warming, they will increase. It's easy to say, but it's hard to do. When the local government go, works together with community and volunteers, builds the way to resilience. Thank you very much. For... Okay. 
Thank you very much, panelists, for painting that picture of what's going on in, in different places around the world. Very different situations, di different circumstances, but a number of key factors are coming out there. So some success stories where, around where progress is being made um, and some challenges um, that, that need to be addressed. And I guess the challenge for us as we are here this week and, and the weeks ahead are, okay, so what does that mean for HFA2? What does that mean for HFA2, for the post-2015 framework as things move forward? So I want to now open up the floor, really, to hear points, themes, questions that you may want to raise from the floor. Now, we, uh, I need your help with this because I don't want to, we, I, we haven't got time for a kind of Q&A backwards and forwards. We could do that for the next uh, three or four years. So I'd be, uh, I would be grateful if you could uh, say your name, where you're from, and make your points, and we'll take a few points, and then I'll go back to the, uh, the panel. So I'm looking for, for hands in the floor. Please, lady down here. If you could uh, speak loudly into that microphone so we can all hear, it would be fantastic. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I am Vanessa Rosales, and I am in charge of the National Committee for Risk Prevention and Emergencies in Costa Rica. I'd like to congratulate the panelists because they've made some very valuable contributions to this session. And I'd just like to stress that we have an early warning system, and uh, I'd like to say how important it is for us to hear lessons learned uh, from elsewhere. We have to remember that we don't have a NAMI in my country. And so uh, responding to disasters and emergencies is something which requires a great deal of coordination. Our early warning system received uh, support from the WMO and the World Bank, and it brings in a whole range of actors at the national level, and they uh, contribute to the system. We have technical staff, we have institutional organizers at the local and national levels, and all the different actors from the community are pivotal players. It's important to have empowerment, growth, and leadership on the part of the community members themselves. They're the ones who contribute principally to the early warning system, particularly during the rainy season. And it's very important to remember that uh, these opportunities to think and exchange experiences, update our legislation, and so on, are a real boon for us. By analogy, I'd also go so far as to say that these contributions should be built into the HFA2 framework as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, perspective from down here, please. Yeah. Merci. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank all of the panelists. I have a question. We know the causes of disasters, and we know the fallout from disasters. We also know what we have to do to avoid them. Scientific and technical progress are significant nowadays. So in light of all of this, at a time when science and technology are moving forward, how can we understand the fact that there are still disasters and thousands of people still die on an annual basis? Should we not consider disasters to be human rights violations? Okay, thank you very much. If you could just uh, name an organization or, or where you're from, that would be great. Okay, let's take a point over there, please. Yes, thank you, gentlemen. As, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. I think this, panel, uh, this, uh, this first meeting today was very good because it shows us really what is uh, disaster management and resiliency. Uh, however, I have some uh, uh, a comment to make or it uh, could be uh, open to discussion. Uh, so we, we, we are not equal to uh, when facing disasters. And as a pan, uh, some, uh, some members said, uh, some, are, some of us are more equal than others. Uh, which is very important. So we try to, uh, I remember Schumacher, Dr. Schumacher says that uh, concerns of people are all often disconnected uh, by, uh, by stakeholders. That's why there are s uh, so many troubles in, in reducing risk for poor people. Um, so our, our solution is to invest today for tomorrow, of course, and, but uh, those solutions are not to be taxing. I mean, I mean all good ideas, innovations, uh, sometimes uh, cost less than big, big emergency planning. So um, also, um, 
um, uh, for example, I heard that uh, um, somebody said, I think it was Fiji, Fiji says that uh, needed some help. I think you have good example of shelters in Nicaragua. Nicaragua managed to, to make uh, an hybrid organization with WMO and uh, local, local based uh, people knowledge. So they built an early warning system which was working fine and which have a protection for, for local people and also for the tourists. And uh, this can be implemented, of course, in, uh, in Fiji. I don't know if it's like these ideas. Anyway, I think uh, uh, dis disaster reduction and climate change has to do a lot with a uh, uh, level of uncertainty of the futures. So as we don't know the future, I think we have to build our own future. And uh, we have to build our organization to reduce risk. And of course, if we, we, if we want, if we, we wait too much about uh, organization who forecast the weather or uh, organization who spend a lot of money, we will never change. Uh, uh, even WMO has a trouble to find uh, money for 70 countries in the world. We still haven't got any, any clim climate services. So uh, those climate services for 70 poorest countries in the world can take time to come. So future is uncertain. We have to build an organization which, which can bring resiliency to people. And uh, what we've learned today was very important how to, and, and show, us, uh, show us the road. And last, my last point was about a uh, hurricane in, uh, in 2005, Katarina. You, you have typically, typically something which is un understandable because, uh, because uh, the, the, pop the white people of, of Katarina managed, managed to save their life. Uh, uh, and, and black people was, was not able to, to save their life. The, the, the perception of risk was different than white people. So, uh, for, example, for example, if white, black people didn't evacuate on time uh, uh, Katarina, uh, 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 the south coast, because, because they, uh, some people like it to have the cats, and, and, and the, the hurricane was very strong, and people were looking for the cats, and because they didn't find the cat, they didn't want to evacuate the house. So that was very strange. Maybe the, maybe the cat now is living and the, the people is, is dead. Thank you. Good point there. I need your help with this because I want to hear a range of different points. And so if you can make them uh, uh, clearly and quickly to, to help, that would be fantastic. So we had a point over here. Thank you. Bueno, gracias. Mi nombre es Carlos Thank you Martín very Pérez. much. I am the director of the risk management facility in Colombia. Me parece que la it seems to me that the involvement of everyone from different regions has, uh, in this session has uh, brought a number of points to light. And the main thing here is saving lives, early warning systems, modeling, simulation, coordination, all these different aspects are about saving lives. My question relates to risk awareness. How does that fit into all of these frameworks? On many occasions, communities are exposed to risk because they're not aware of risks, and they even contribute to risks as a result of this. I've listened to many different speakers here, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Brazil in particular mentioned uh, issues relating to risk awareness and how that can be used to mitigate, mitigate risk. Thank you very much. You. Okay, so the point around uh, risk awareness. Okay, now I'll come back to the panel on some of these points in a second, please. Uh, thanks, um, Margaret Arnold from the World Bank. I really like the point that um, our colleague from the Parliament of Uganda raised about engaging with communities at the policy level. And I think the presentations I was particularly impressed with from Nicaragua and India of uh, communities organizing going up to that level. And I would love to hear more from the government representatives on the panel on um, reflections on how to do that better. Thank you. Yeah, OK, thank you much. Take two more points, and then I'm going to go back to the panel. Please, lady over there. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Odile Bilten, and I work with uh, UNICEF in Niger. Um, yesterday, the director, the executive director of the WMO, World Meteorological Organization, mentioned that we tend to focus on uh, best practices and lessons learned, and very seldomly on worst practices. Um, so taking the point from La Señora de Nicaragua, I would like to know, and especially from a women gender perspective, 
um, whether she would have examples and also the other colleagues that are involved at the community level of worst practices so that other communities can step up and learn from that and go straight to what worked and not go through the painful experience of what didn't work before they could go to what worked. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so this challenge of, of identifying best practices and worst practices. Let me just ask, are there any donors in the room who, uh, who would uh, like to make a point? Because I, I just want to hear, hear a perspective from a, from a donor, if I can. Are there any donors in the room who would like to make a point there? I'm looking for some hands raised to, to perhaps hear a different perspective. No, okay, I just want to check. Any, uh, we have? We have a, okay, don, a donor perspective? No, I'm not seeing one. Okay, okay. Well, I am. I'm, I'm, uh, okay. Please go ahead. If if you if you make that donor perspective, go ahead, because it's interesting to get these different perspectives. No, I'm seeing some pointing and some non-pointing. Okay, please. Hello, Amanda Ellis from New Zealand, former head of the New Zealand Aid Program. I think one of the lessons that we've learned in the Pacific is the importance of working with communities for, for example, creating tsunami early warning systems and making sure that they're fully engaged and know what to do and where to go in alignment and partnership with the National Management Disaster Offices. Okay. So making sure the community groups and the governments are connected. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm just going to return to the panel for a second and invite uh, responses from the panel. Um, there's some challenges and, 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 and uh, uh, questions that have been raised there, particularly to uh, our government uh, representatives. So uh, maybe, uh, Alex, if I, could, uh, if I could come to you and uh, uh, invite you to respond to some of the points you've heard. Thank you very much. I just got one from uh, World Bank. Yes, I was talking about engagement of uh, local communities at that level. We are in the process of trying to say, yes, as members of parliament, how do we support this agenda? How do we help to ensure that whatever we do put in place is not only put on a white paper like this one, put on shelves, fill up an office, no. We are saying whatever we put in place should be, uh, sh should be made into action that assist the communities to be resilient. And uh, you can only achieve that very good results if the community does participate in the formulation of one of that policy and of that law, sometimes I was saying we go to parliament, we go to our local councils, we think for people. We don't think that maybe people also have ideas that can feed into our own to make them a little bit more wider, modern, and the way it should be. What does that mean? It Im involvement means ownership. The moment you saw here, vivid vivid examples where communities are involved in the planning in the planning and in the formulation of these policies they tend to own them and they tend to to do well and they tend to get results okay thank you thank you alex and um, uh, minister k maybe if i could turn to you as well because i know kind of that that challenge of working effectively um has been a key point that you raised maybe you could uh, um Elaborate a little bit on that. Sure. Um, look, I'm just going to cover off a couple of points because I made a few notes around uh, points raised by different speakers. The first thing is, in terms of early warning systems, as has been uh, raised by Amanda, um, New Zealand, we see ourselves obviously in terms of best practice around our emergency system, sharing that with our international partners. So we are doing uh, tsunami mapping in Samoa, we're helping in Vanuatu uh, around volcanic monitoring. Which leads me on to the next point, which was a point that was raised around the importance of science. And we have, if anything, stepped up our investment around uh, science because we see that as absolutely crucial in mitigating risks. And that's a big part of our uh, civil defence uh, framework. Another comment was uh, made regarding um, what happens with vulnerable communities when, I think someone said, but not all communities are equal. And I think in terms of that capability, that's been a crucial lesson of Canterbury, as I mentioned. We've got a review around vulnerable people, people with disabilities. How do we ensure in the um, aftermath that we really get to them quickly? Uh, another point was made around engaging, how do we ensure and that was a direct request to ask, I think, the government representatives, how do we ensure that there's engagement of communities at a policy level 
We have a couple of things. Firstly, we have a civil defence emergency management strategy and plan. Uh, there's an ability to have both community engagement and public consultation on that. Uh, the second thing that I'd say is, because our system in New Zealand works at a local government level, uh, there is the ability to engage in that planning framework at that level, but I think where we as a country will want to do more, it's getting down to even a more kind of community level so that whether it's the scout group or whether it's neighbourhood watch, they are taking ownership of um, hazards at a really local level. So we've got to go down to that further uh, layer. Then finally, um, the other point that I made here was around uh, sharing that best practice. And I just really would stress everything that I've learnt from the last, um, uh, from the time that I've been here, is we do not need to reinvent the wheel. There is a huge amount that countries are doing, both at a local and community level, and we've got to share that best practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if I could, uh, if I could, hi Dave. Hi Dave, so one of the things that you've been, you brought alive in, in your presentation was how effective that you've been in building those partnerships and learning those lessons and moving forward. So perhaps you could uh, reflect on some of those key success factors. What has enabled you to build those partnerships? What has enabled that effective communication between uh, different people? Well, for us, everything that we've learned has really come from our suffering. For instance, uh, in certain uh, cases, uh, women have gone out in the community to offer assistance, and uh, if those actions hadn't been taken, people could have died. And so everything concerning mapping, dialogue with uh, the municipal authorities, uh, local dialogue in general, organizing women uh, for committees, emergency response teams, and so on. All of this is uh, important. We've got a risk reduction policy as well. So all of our involvement in consultations has contributed, and it's very important, therefore, to be included at the local level, at the territory level, uh, it's important for us to be involved. If we're not involved, we can't di uh, engage in dialogue. We can't be left out of this. We have to be in it. We have to be involved in it. We can't have uh, us on one side and the authorities on the other. We have to work together. Hi, Dave. Okay, so a number of themes are coming out here, and Violet at the end there has a challenging uh, role here now to play back some of those themes, okay? A number of points have been raised, a number of themes, and I know there are many, many more questions and many, many more points that need to be made. And that's what this platform is all about, and that's what future weeks and, and future uh, uh, opportunities will be all about. But I'm now going to invite uh, Violet to, to just recap some of those themes um, uh, and leave us with a few closing messages before we, uh, we close this session. Over to you, Violet. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate our panelists, and I'm sure everyone is really appreciating the rich knowledge we have gotten from the panelists here and the government. Uh, I think one thing that uh, I've really uh, been following is how we have had myths around uh, how community, how we perceive communities. We have known communities to be vulnerable, helpless, therefore uh, we cannot involve them in planning. We take them as beneficiaries of the projects that come to respond to disaster. And here you can actually see how communities are demonstrating and working around these needs and really showcasing that they are not fragmented. They don't respond to one individual issue. They respond to, uh, they have a comprehensive approach and can organize further in their communities. I think that is one key thing that came in today's presentation. And we have seen uh, that the essential tool that came today is community organizing. How that tool is powerful. Often, I always say it's not a priority of donors. People don't believe that organizing can actually be put in any budget 
you cannot cost organizing, therefore it has never been prioritized. But we have seen that organizing came out as a tool for the women federations, for the partnerships that the women and the communities are seeking in the communities. And the lessons we have learned here on how partnership is happening. Often partnership has not been inclusive. Partnership has been like a top up uh, top bottom approach but now you can see this partnership that was surfacing here even from the governments is how this partnership is inclusive in enabling communities to be part of the planning to be part of the implementation and be part of the monitoring and monitoring has really been key here on how the communities are feedbacking the government on what is working and what is not working. And I think that was a very rich, we saw from Nicaragua that even how communities are able to shape how they want their governments to look like and tell, like set agreements with governments on what is it that you are going to deliver in the issue of disaster and resilience. I think that was very powerful. Uh, I would just want to give uh, key highlights on the yoga framework of action. Um, I call upon uh, our attention today to actually see that um, uh, it's important for us to synthesize the report and the key findings in the regional consultations, thus provide the registration and the package for how we affirm. And similarly, we have seen from the, the partnership that, uh, from the panelists that it's important to ensure that realities of local decision makers and citizens noting that mayors and community organizations are in the front line and center of disaster and knowledge of the resilience building. Uh, it is also important that uh, the panelists here are, are showing that it is important for us to ensure that the grassroots um, platform here is really coming up with recommendations on how we are going to insensitize participatory, transparent local planning, programming and monitoring. They are also noted that currently, many progressive initiatives, the local councils, the local budgets for disaster resilience, for example, easily come and go. And this is actually a challenge. It's important to change the public administration and elected leadership. It is therefore important for us to shift from the projects and go to programs. It is not good for us to limit the, uh, program, the projects that we, we call them projects, the work that we do around disaster, disaster. Let us make it to be programmed so that they can be sustained because we are talking of sustainable development. Peer learning has come up as essential. Let us think about how we can promote learning across locals and across nations. That is actually a key aspect that we need to come up with from this globe of platform. And I just want to say that this has been a discussion um, two days ago. The, there was a grassroots academy where the communities were learning from each other. And it's actually becoming evident that we are not going to work on disaster without including communities, without shifting the way we have been planning and start thinking of a bottom-up approach in planning, in monitoring, and in assessing how the impact that is happening in the community. Because as my friend from Uganda said is, unless we, we think local, we start local, then we will never be even global. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Violet. Thank you very much. OK, we are out of time, unfortunately. So please, first of all, just join me in thanking our panelists for their input, for their stories, for their expertise. Thank you. And also thank you to you and I guess our closing invitation and our closing challenge is to continue this discussion, continue this debate, take this into the other sessions that will be going on today, tomorrow and moving forward. Um, and the panelists are all here for you to continue that discussion with them uh, right now if you wish. Thank you very much for your participation and we will see you during the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>